Welcome back to Echo Ridge and another episode here on Rikazon in our max difficulty achievement run. Today, we need to cool all this metal off. As of right now, all the metal drops in temperature to whatever the industrial sauna is sitting at. For instance, right now all this steam is sitting at 133 degrees and the cobalt's coming out at around 136. Not too shabby. There's been some suggestions to say I should set up a loop in here as well. I don't really need to do that, and the reason why is because we're going to be chilling it down significantly in a robust debris chiller. Plus, if we decide, you know what, there's just way too much metal going through this industrial sauna, so it's not cooling down enough, well, at that point we can just add more rails so it stays in the sauna longer. And remember, because we're going to be flushing so much polluted water through the sauna, we're going to want the sauna to stay particularly hot specifically above about 120 degrees. That way, all the polluted water instantly flashes into steam. I'm getting the thermo aqua tuner that's going to be responsible for the cooling loop installed, except, well, I built it out of copper ore, because apparently 2,000 hours in oxygen not included isn't enough to teach you some of the simple lessons. So while I get that rebuilt, I think it's time to finally transfer all of our power over there which is going to have the side effect of injecting all the natural gases heat into the sauna as well. Now, it will take a significant amount of steel, but that's not a big deal because we have a small steel factory on this planetoid now. Now, when I built this sauna, I used seven tile high scaffolding because duplicants can dig from three tiles below the ladders and four tiles above the ladders. But this isn't the way we want it to look for real because it'd be a lot of wasted space, especially when we put down something like a natural gas geyser. We wouldn't want to put one here and then another one down here. Another consideration is we're going to want to put a power control station somewhere in here, which means we need to make this into a power plant as well. So we're going to be building these weird little rooms inside the sauna for use with the hydrogen generators and the natural gas generators. This is a pretty good start. We still have some more work to do in here, but we have the smart battery and we're going to be connecting the natural gas generators with the automation. We have a power control station and it pretty much mirrors the setup for the hydrogen generators as well. And while this sauna was really big to start off with, we're about to use up a lot of the space. Specifically because I also need to add a bunch of gas reservoirs as well. I love buffer tanks of all sizes. Whether it be the big gas reservoir buffer tank or the small liquid reservoir buffer tank. They're all beautiful, but this is going to work out just fine. For this very last platform, I'm choosing to use some aluminum metal tiles instead of mesh tiles. And that way, the polluted water that's coming out of the natural gas geysers is going to fall and then hit these tiles, which will be very warm because the metal coming hot off the presses passes right by them. This will help guarantee that the water will flash instead of hitting this abyssalite and sort of pulling up a little bit. Now we're going to have to do some fancy piping because I don't want to lose these eight reservoirs worth of natural gas while we're in the process of transferring everything over into the industrial sauna. We're going to go insulated gas pipes up until the sauna, but then we're just going to go to regular gas pipes. For the simple reason, we want the heat. This is how the piping's going to look. I know it's kind of tough to see, but I'll loop back here in a minute once all the dupes finish up with the 400 tasks we've given them. In addition to the natural gas, we also need to transfer in all of that hydrogen as well. But most of this hydrogen is already pretty cool at around 60 degrees. So in this case, we're going to be keeping the gas pipes as insulated, and that way it doesn't actually have the effect of cooling down the sauna. A small update on the rest of the temperature here on Rikazon. If you remember, we installed a nice cooling loop, which has done a decent job of cooling all this down. Unfortunately, this area up here is still really hot. For a second, I thought it might have been the steam turbines that have heated this whole area up, except, well, the steam turbines haven't ran that often. So now I'm starting to think the abyssalite is starting to transfer, because for those of you who didn't know, there is some weird bugs related to abyssalite transfer of thermals. And if you look at it, the origin point seems to be right here. So just to be safe, I'm covering this area and going to put some insulated tiles in. And while I'm at it, I might as well replace the rest of the single tile abyssalite. I'm not worried about places like this where it's multiple tiles worth of abyssalite because I don't believe the thermals will be able to transfer all the way through. But then again, I suppose it could just be the fact that the steam turbines have started to run again. Not a big deal because this thermo aqua tuner is going to be responsible for keeping them cool as well, but it's going to be a nuisance until we get this thing built for the simple reason that we're injecting a bunch of heat 
in the area that the duplicates have to pass. Okay, so what happens when you have two dupes down? Sorry, Ryan. That cod is no longer used for you. Until Ryan also passes out. All right, let me give this a rethink. Oh, Carol, you look like you're doing so much better. Can Ryan borrow your cot for a few minutes? Thank you. Apparently, Carol didn't want to give up her cot, so we had to make Ryan a new one. You're looking good, buddy. In other news, we have a plan to have all the gas end up over here. And what did I end up building the hydrogen generators out of? Gold amalgam. Oops, I did it again. Anyways, we're just going to have it come out of the gas reservoirs and hook a right right back to the same pipe it came from, except we're going to disconnect the input. We're also going to disconnect it here from the natural gas generators and then deconstruct this bridge. We'll flip it around. The last thing we really need to do is send the carbon dioxide out. And this is not too bad. We're going to use the same method that we used before and just dump it right out here where all the dust caps are oh so appreciative for being able to bathe inside the carbon dioxide. We'll put a nice high pressure gas vent. Easy peasy. While the duplicates are working on all these projects, we're able to recover a lot of materials from disassembling this old power plant. Which is funny because, well, we don't need the materials. Oh, wait a minute. I had power transformers in here. I just realized I'm gonna have to move all those as well. Eek. In the meantime, the entire base just went dark. Oopsie. No big deal. We're gonna be fine. Okay. These meteors are really starting to upset me. I'm gonna have to eventually build some steel bunker tiles and prevent all this from happening. They are just gutting right through our colony. Poor Zadnax is all sorts of stuck. I mean, look at the disaster these meteors left. I'm telling you, they must be getting bigger and bigger. In the meantime, I'm just gonna put a layer of obsidian down. Let's see what the meteors can do here. As previously promised, here's the natural gas reservoirs and their piping. Unfortunately, we're not using enough natural gas. We are all the way backed up and we still have some in these containers. It wouldn't be so bad. It's just we're not using enough power, but that's about to change as soon as we get this thermo aqua tuner online. That was all the way up to like nine or 10 tons of aluminum. Unfortunately, this project is sort of eaten it all. Not a big deal because we have so much cobalt and the difference between cobalt and aluminum is not too bad. For instance, mostly what I'm going to have to replace with cobalt is the metal tiles. And here is an aluminum metal tile, and it has a thermal conductivity of 205 and a specific heat capacity of 0.91. Whereas the cobalt has a thermal conductivity of 100 and a specific heat capacity of 0.42. So the aluminum is still better by over a factor of two, but the cobalt is no slouch either. The loop is disgustingly large. Comes out of the thermo aqua tuner is going to keep this entire giant metal brick cool and then head back over to the other side of the steam turbines to keep them cool with whatever chill is left and then back into the aqua tuner. I'm gonna get this thing loaded up and fired on and that way as we're building this, it'll already start cooling everything off. And for our projects, we've sent over some more supplies from the home planetoid to include 73 kilos worth of berry sludge to keep the dupes fed because we're down to 116,000 calories along with another two and a half tons of super coolant. We'll empty that storage. That for some reason, they always try to empty it by shooting in the other direction. It's the only building I've ever seen them do that. And they've done it multiple times. I just had failed to show it to you in previous episodes. I'm getting all the super coolant loaded. I don't love the fact that I did this because it's so much easier when you bridge it on. That way you get just the right amount, but I'm gonna keep an eye on it and then forget about it and overfill the line. Do not worry. But while I'm doing that, I'm starting to build the rail network as well. We're coming right off of this existing rail. In fact, I'm going to move it over just a little bit to make it a little cleaner. And the whole idea is it's going to go around and around until it finally gets a temperature check up here. Although with this much thermal mass and super coolant, I don't think that metal is going to stand a chance. And as long as I've gotten everything right, here's the basic framework. The metal is going to come in through here, through this conveyor bridge. Remember, this bridge will only allow materials to drop onto this line as long as this line is empty. They're then going to go all the way through here and end up being temperature checked at this conveyor rail thermo sensor. If the materials are below, say, 25 degrees, it'll turn the conveyor shut off on and allow materials to pass through, which will then be dropped off into this conveyor chute. Eventually, this rail is going to go all the way up into an interplanetary launcher and get launched off to the home planetoid. 
baby steps though. In the eventuality that the materials are too hot, they will bypass this input, head into this input, and then go around the loop one more time. Now it always takes a little finagling, so I'll let you know how this goes in a minute. I forgot to snip the rails before we were finished, but just going through this amount of metal tiles, the cobalt's already sitting down at 40 degrees. But for a combination of the fact that the conveyor shutoff is not power jet, it's bypassing and the loop is working as planned. I mean, that's a good sign. The coolant loop is filled and we've turned the thermo aqua tuner on. It's set to 10 degrees with the idea that these metal tiles are gonna stay around 10 degrees. So it should have no problem keeping all the materials cold and at least under 25. We've also added in more radiant liquid pipes, except these aren't for our cooling loop. Rather, they're gonna be for the water coming out of the steam turbines. Whereas that water normally comes out above 90 degrees, it'll then be chilled and then used to be able to provide water for our electrolyzer setup. We'll get to that in a little bit. Um, Puffed, you might wanna leave now. If you haven't noticed, the walls are sort of closing in on you. With thus nearing being finished, we need to flush a lot of this hot debris that was sitting in this little hot box back through the system. And I figured the easiest way, instead of grabbing it and bringing it all the way down here to put back in like that, we'll just set up a temporary conveyor loader and throw it in manually. Something like this. I'm also going to stop everything from coming in for a little while. And then all I have to do is allow manual use, sweep only and all, and just sweep it all up. For the record, when we started, all the metal tiles are sitting at two degrees. Thank you, super coolant. It would definitely help if I didn't drop all the materials back into the same pile. So we're going to deconstruct this conveyor chute and just move it over by one. Now the natural gas generators nor the hydrogen generators are able to run. These batteries aren't budging from 20 kilojoules because we have five steam turbines all rocking out with about 570 watts apiece. And by the way, the metal tiles are at three degrees. Oh, it's glorious. Since I still have all of this water to work through before I even need to start tapping into the steam in order to run the electrolyzer, not to mention all this polluted water down here, I've decided to put off the whole water filtration and chilling system. So instead, we're setting up our interplanetary launching system. And right now it looks like it's a mess because, well, it is. To start off with, I've set up another couple of power transformers. One is only responsible for the debris chiller and for a portion of our interplanetary launching system. The other is sort of in backup. It's gonna be running all of these bunker doors, one more rad bolt generator and our space scanner. Now, if I've done this correctly, what's gonna happen is the space scanner is gonna detect meteors coming. When it does, it's gonna shut the doors. And that way the meteors can't impact our little site here. When there are no meteors coming down, the space scanner is gonna send out a red signal, which this knot gate is gonna flip to a green, which is gonna enable the interplanetary launcher to be able to launch payloads and open these doors back up. When I was designing this system, I thought there was gonna be another problem. in the fact that as soon as we send the green signal, these doors are gonna start opening but the interplanetary launcher is just going to immediately start wanting to fire. So I thought about putting a buffer gate or something in to make sure that the interplanetary launcher is delayed a little bit behind the doors so we can make sure the doors are fully open before we start firing little missiles at it. But then I realized I don't think it'll fire when the launch path is blocked. So I don't even think we need this green signal here. But I figured I'd play around with it a little bit and see what happens. Now all this stuff is going to get pretty warm. So we're going to end up putting a little bit of super coolant in the bottom here and we're going to be keeping that super coolant cool by use of the metals that we're about to ship off. At least I hope that's going to be enough. And then over on our home planetoid of Tuxedo, we've set up another building inside of our shipping and receiving center. And that is the payload opener. We have a targeting beacon here and we're going to add an auto sweeper that hopefully gets just about all of the payloads as they land. And for the record, Look how little refined metals we have left. So when an interplanetary payload lands, the auto super will grab it, put it in the payload opener. And once the payload is opened, it'll automatically be dropped down into these rails and drop out of the chute and land right here. Now, eventually, when we get more metals, I'll probably drop it off all the way down at our infinite storage. But as you can guess, we don't have many metal ores either. And so far, the system's up and running. Now, these rad bolt generators are not great. I'm gonna have to think of another solution. And the reason why I say that is because they're only collecting seven rad bolts per cycle. 
So between the three of them, they're going to be collecting about 21. Now, it only costs 50 rad bolts to send one payload over to Toxedo, but at that rate, it would only be one payload per two cycles. And I'm not all about that. So what we're going to do is I'm going to move these rad bolt generators up and then try using the conduction panels. Something like this here. One side of the conduction panel is sitting in the super coolant that will hopefully stay chill. And the other side is going to be touching these rad bolt generators. Fingers crossed. So the last thing we have to do is actually connect the chiller to the system. Now right now we're going to go with 50% of all the metals are going to head off to our home planetoid and 50% are going to stay here. Now that's only going to last for so long because eventually the metals are going to get backed up onto that rail. And so this will also act as a sort of overflow. All right. Well, that failed on both parts. Not only is the conduction panel not really working because these rad bolt generators are already up to 81 degrees, but they're only collecting about one or two more rad bolts per cycle. And that's a source of frustration for the simple reason. I don't have a source of radiation here other than the sky and Weezworts. Which I suppose is sort of the solution. I could set up a nice Weezwort V that provides a lot of radiation. Feed that to the Radbolt generators. The Weezworts would actually help keep the Radbolt generators cool. And all would be hunky-dory. Except for the fact that I don't have a sustainable source of phosphorite here. Unless, of course, I started ranching Drekos or shipping phosphorite from the other planetoid. And at that point, it's just a lot of micromanagement. Which I'm trying to avoid. For now, though, we'll just plant a Weezwort and deal with it. Now, with the Weezwort, this one rad bolt generator itself is producing about 50 rad bolts per cycle. The second one, 40, and the third one, 32. You can see how I could even just shift this all over by one and put another Weezwort right here, and we'd have plenty of rad bolts to send three, four, or even five shipments per cycle. The last little bit of automation I put in is once the interplanetary launcher is filled with rad bolts, it will turn the rad bolt generators off, conserving power and hopefully cooling them off a little bit. Another solution I could use is by putting the rad bolt generators in our Weezwort farm inside the colony. There'd be an environment here, and then I could send the rad bolts up into the space biome and then into the interplanetary launcher. For now though, I'm gonna try tinkering with this system because I really don't like it very much. The great thing too is the interplanetary launcher, while it can only send 200 kilos at a time, it can store a lot more than that. I don't know what its max is, but we're gonna find out. But our first interplanetary payload is on its way and is going to be to our home planetoid in 85 seconds. And we have Splashdown. The auto sweeper grabs the payload, puts it inside the payload opener. The little can opener opens it. Come on, dump the good stuff. And at last, look at all the beautiful gold. Unfortunately, it's a little warmer than I wanted, which I'm not 100% sure why, because... All the contents of the interplanetary launcher, even after going through this super coolant, is sitting at 40 degrees. So maybe hurling bullets through space actually warms them up? I don't know. I'm gonna have to do some more research on that one. But that's gonna about do it for today's episode. And tell you the truth, you're not gonna see much more of Rikazon going forward. We've got most of the meat and potatoes done. Sure, we'll come visit it every once in a while, but I think we're about done with the full time episodes here on this planetoid. Next up, I think it's time to get some liquid hydrogen rockets going, don't you? Let me know what you think in the comments below, and what you'd do different about this system, or this one. So until next time, much love, happy gaming, and I'll talk to you soon.